Hi there and welcome to Money Talks, where we take a look at the rural economy as it affects you in the ag sector. In this edition, to Russia with love, we do the deal and kickstart unprecedented free trade talks with one of the biggest countries in the world. Ten days on, the crippling cost of the continuing kiwi fruit crisis. How many millions of dollars will taxpayers have to stump up to contain it? And the countdown is on. Just two weeks to go before the close of the Wool Partners Co-op Prospectus. What do our panel experts predict wool growers will do? All this and much, much more coming up. But first, there's been plenty of talk about currency intervention in recent weeks. Here at home, the Reserve Bank's jumping in and speaking Swahili. Well, kind of. Joining us to tell us more is ASB Rural Economist James Shortle. James, how's your Swahili today? <laughs> yeah, I don't know a lot of Swahili, to be honest. But uh, there's definitely some interesting comments. Now, what's all this uh, Alan Bollard using a Swahili proverb to describe what's going on with our economy? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess what he was what he was getting at was, um, you know, that we can really be be crushed by the global factors that are occurring overseas, and and um, you know what that really means to uh, to us here in New Zealand, what impact we can we can, we can have. So if we if if the if the global markets start playing, then we get, then we've got potential to be uh, to be crushed a little bit. Well, as Mr. Bollard said, let me get it. Correct. When the elephants make love or war, the grass gets crushed. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a pretty apt uh, metaphor, don't you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I guess the currency market and, and the global marketplace and we're minnows in terms of that. So, um, you know, by by intervening, then uh, you know we 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 do the run the risk that uh, we could could cause some problems. What kind of problems could happen if, if the Reserve Bank does jump in? Because, you know, they've done it before. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the, the key question is what what real impact can they can they have? They, they can they can go and buy some currency, um, whether that's going to be enough to really uh, push the currency lower. Um, uh, there's a big question mark around that. I, I suspect that, that it wouldn't. Um, and, of course, uh, as soon as Reserve Banks do start jumping into currency markets, then um, it does provide a, a good opportunity for speculators and for the big hedge, hedge funds around the world who do have market presence who do dominate the market, then they, uh, it does give them some opportunities to come in and, and, and play around in the market. Now, with the U.S. Fed, of course, pumping, what, $600 billion uh, U.S. into their economy, uh, what kind of effect is it having on our dollar, let's say, over the past week? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the U.S. dollar immediately after that announcement, then it did, it did soften, um, and that's why we did see the currency move up close to 80 cents. Uh, didn't quite crack the 80 cent mark, but, um, you know, it has softened again since then. So really, I think that's going to be a key factor for the currency over the next little while is that we're going to see uh, the U.S. dollar weak against all currencies, including the New Zealand dollar. Um, I think when Dr. Bollard um, sort of made those those statements, there's been a lot of talk about currency markets in the mix around the globe um, the last few weeks or few months. Um, and, you know, there has been some talk about the Reserve Bank stepping in and, and lowering our own currency. But really, he, he said, you know, the reason the Kiwi dollar is strong is because of those factors out of the US, um, not, you know, the, and as well as some local factors here in New Zealand. So some things are out of our control. And also very high commodity prices. Yeah, well, the, the Reserve Bank to intervene in currency markets, they really need to, to look at it and see, is, is there a, a fundamental reason why the New Zealand dollar is out of whack with what's happening in the global marketplace? So when they, when they made this statement last week, and they made it quite clear that uh, the, another reason why the currency is high is because we've got high international commodity prices. So that's dairy prices, forestry prices, beef prices, land prices, wool prices, all of those sorts of things are all boosting our own economy. So really, um, you know, to, reading between the lines is, well, you know, perhaps our economy is actually doing pretty, pretty well relative to the, a lot of the other places. And that's the reason why the currency is high. So, you know, fundamentally, our, our currency should be a little bit higher than, than what it has been. OK, let's talk dairy now. Global dairy trade auction overnight. How do we do? Yeah, prices were pretty flat. I mean, um, I think on a trade weighted basis, they, they fell by 0.1%. So really, that's 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 almost no change from uh, from two weeks ago. Uh, whole milk powder did fall a little bit more. The, the fat-based products uh, were slightly higher. So um, I think the fact that prices are, are, are stable is, continues to be a really good story for, for payout for this coming year. And how's China doing as a driving factor? Still going to be big? Oh, I think so. I mean, China uh, continues to drive the... I mean all commodity markets around the globe, whether it's dairy, whether it's, uh, whether it's the hard metals, that sort of thing. So, um, But they definitely have been driving dairy and um, they're going to continue to drive that in the future as well as other developing countries. Now, interesting, at the recent World Dairy Conference here in Auckland, the delegates were polled instantly, 2,200, and 70% of them apparently picked that uh, the price next year is going to be, what, 3,800 uh, a tonne. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, if it is 3,800 a tonne uh, in US dollar terms, 
and that's going to be fantastic news for farmers here in New Zealand. I Do you uh, think it's too optimistic? I, I think it might be a little bit optimistic to, to say 12 months from now that, that prices are going to be that high. Right now we're sort of, you know, 34, 3500 US dollars per tonne for whole milk powder. Um, I think we're leading into the beginning of next year. We've already heard Andrew Ferrier say that, um, you know, perhaps we, uh, you know, US dairy production could be higher. Um, I, that's, that's a view that I share also as well as uh, European dairy production into the beginning of next year. So that could have a factor on prices. Um, but of course, around this time of the year, then, then the, uh, the EU and the US markets are slowing down. So we do start to see prices run up. But um, I, I would, uh, I, you know, I'd be uh, a little bit hesitant to say that, that we're going to see prices um, stronger than what they currently are, because they are very, very strong levels. OK, in 30 seconds or less, James, I know you can do this. Uh, how are the prices tracking for lamb and for beef? Land prices on an international scale still really strong. Uh, beef prices also are, are looking really strong. So I think on an international on an, inter, an international scale for meat, um, things are looking really good. Uh, of course, the currency at current levels is is been a bit of a dampener, but um, you know, that's going to impact on schedules this year. But generally, for both beef and lamb, I'm, I'm predicting that schedules will be higher than they have been last year. Thanks, James. Coming up after the break, should our dairy and meat farmers be celebrating now that the giant Russian bear has given the green light to free trade talks with the tiny kiwi? At the APEC summit, John Key talks tough to Japan as global trade power brokers talk Turkey in Yokohama. Plus, much, much more, but first, answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What's the largest country in the world in landmass? The answer when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what's the largest country in the world in landmass? The answer, Russia. It covers a ninth of the earth, has nine time zones, and is home to one quarter of the world's fresh water. Joining us now is editor of the National Business Review, Neville Gibson. And it looks like John Key has had a very good APEC in Japan. 21 countries from the Pacific Rim there, Neville. How do you think he did? I think you must have done well. APEC is about free trade, but usually it gets uh, gazumped by some other issue and uh, we've had terrorism and that sort of thing. So this time they actually had to come up on free trade and it really showed the colours of the countries involved. APEC got going because of um, an Australian-driven initiative and uh, there are some laggards in there like Japan, but uh, he was able to hold some pretty strong ground because New Zealand's involvement in the Trans-Tasman Pacific Partnership, it's quite a pure free trade agreement and I think that's uh, what we need and if others want to join they should be playing by those rules. Neville, very simply, how does it all work because there are now so many deals around. We have Doha, we've got uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, uh, we have APEC. Uh, where do they fit in the pecking order? Well Doha's dead. Uh, so the... Well it seems to be. Yeah. <laughs> So what you had, arising out of APEC, you had one or two countries like New Zealand and some smaller ones who believe in the free trade deal and they believe in multilateralism. So they actually sort of got together and it's widened now to uh, a lot of other countries wanting to join Malaysia, Peru, countries like that. So the uh, thing about trade is that people see it as a zero-sum game, that if you don't give a concession to someone else and you get one in return. In New Zealand and some other countries, Singapore is another, where you just sort of say, we're not going to have any tariffs. And you really benefit from that, and we've found that. But you see, other countries don't view it that way. They say, we're not going to give away anything unless you give us something in return. And that's unfortunately where the big countries are, China, the United States, for example. James, we know that in the case of Japan, they've had huge uh, uh, tariffs protecting their agricultural products. Talk to us a bit about that and what's at stake for them. Well, huge. I mean, uh, for their farming, uh, for their farming industry, then you know, I guess if if they take all of those off, um, and some of the countries like ourselves uh, get our products into there, we're, we're obviously highly efficient at producing food. Um, I think, but but realistically, um, the, you know, food in terms of and, and agriculture in the Japanese economy is so small that um, you know the, that it's just it's not going to impact their economy too much. It's just that they have a lot of power. Uh, the farmers in Japan have an enormous amount of power. Isn't their own prime minister uh, taking 
quite a gamble pushing for uh, changing the trade deal. I mean, why is he doing it now, Neville? Well, the irony is that big business in Japan is very much in favour of free trade. That's why they own some of the largest food companies in Australia and New Zealand, and they benefit from it. Uh, they do have problems against countries like Korea, where their car manufacturing industry is heavily protected, so it depends who they are. But uh, one, you know, Japan has been in very bad shape for 20 years now. The former Prime Minister, one of them, uh, did manage to make some changes, but uh, really they've got to have the political guts to do it. And I don't know if Mr Khan can do that. Do you think John Key's going to be able to hold together the deal? He's basically said to the other guys, uh, listen, we're not going to let Japan come in or the United States come in unless they deal to the agricultural issues. Is John Key going to be able to keep it going? Well, he would if he got Australia on side. You know, again, the Australian agricultural producers are highly protective. They've got bananas. You know, they locked out a lot of Asian countries, so they're not. Uh, they haven't got the great credentials either. And New Zealand's small, so Singapore, Brunei, and Chile. So you know, there's there's not a lot going there, but. Uh, it's quite a pure agreement, and I think it's worth hanging on to. The other big surprise, of course, the Russia deal. Russia, for the first time ever, is going to enter a free trade talks, if you like, with little old New Zealand. James, what do you make of that? Oh, I think it's fantastic news. It, it comes at a time when uh, when Russia have just recently imposed some um, some you know a ban on on, on imports of, of uh, frozen chicken out of the U.S. So you know there's been talk about uh, them opening up some trade with the U.S. But they're obviously looking at countries like New Zealand and and um, looking at those opportunities. But they're they're also big agricultural producers themselves. So there's uh, you know there's potential some potential uh, risks there for us and what those opportunities are is is going to take some time to work out. Neville, uh, we're now trading what? about 187 million a year with Russia. What do we give them and what are they likely going to want to give us? Well, that, that is a problem. I mean, the main thing about Russia is that they've looked at China and seen that China has gone the free trade way and, you know, that obviously benefits for them. They're a huge food importer as well as a producer. But this year they put a ban on exports of wheat. Yeah. And, and that was a hugely had a huge impact on the world market, you know. So there's a lot of inefficiencies in Russia and doing business with them is very, very difficult. And I don't see there's going to be any bonanza, but it's a, it was originally sold to the Russians by New Zealand, by the trade minister, as a strategic thing. You do a deal with New Zealand and you'll get the same sort of benefits that China did. That is, you get to learn the ropes, you learn to negotiate, and you see it from the other person's point of view. And let's not forget, gentlemen, Goldman Sachs predicts that uh, by the year uh, 2050, it's likely to be the biggest economy in Europe. I mean, it's just going gangbusters. And at the moment, isn't Russia the biggest importer of, of butter and, and dairy in the world? Is that correct? Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I know that they are a big, a big importer. And of course, New Zealand's had a tradition of, um, of, <laughs> of exporting those products into the Russian market. So Fonterra should be celebrating, correct? Well, they've already been there a long time, and that's one of the big benefits, is we do have New Zealanders who've been working there for 20 or 30 years. They know the, the business inside out, and uh, you know, it's very small, but it's, still, it's there, and we've got an early start. There's no question about that. Okay, let's talk about...